Hi, I'm Dr. V. I'm an interventional pain specialist and chief of the spine pain program at Bloor Pain Specialists in Toronto. But today, I'm going to be answering some common questions about low back pain and sciatica. What is the difference between low back pain and sciatica? That's an excellent question and a really common one too. The sciatic nerve is the biggest nerve in our body. It's the size of a thumb and it starts in the glutes, but it has five roots. And those roots are L4, L5, S1, S2, and S3. They come together out of the spine to form this big, big nerve in the glutes going down the leg. And that's the key. It's going down the leg, starting in the glutes. So sciatica is leg pain that starts from the glutes going down. Now, it doesn't have to involve the whole leg. It doesn't have to be the same in every person. There are different portions of the sciatic nerve that can be affected because different roots can be affected. As a herniated disc typically will push on a root or an arthritic joint pushes on a different one, or the body position or muscle weakness pushes on a third one. You're going to have different symptoms in different people. Some people are going to have it higher up in the glutes hip area or the thigh. Other people are going to have it further down into the toes, the foot, the ankle. Sometimes there's going to be weakness involved. Sometimes there's just going to be a change in sensation. When we're talking about low back pain, we're talking about something entirely different. Anatomically, it's higher up. It's in the back. It's not necessarily in the leg. Although some low back pain structures, the structures that cause low back pain, can radiate some of that pain in a similar pattern to the sciatic nerve. And that's where a lot of the confusion comes in. So for example, in the back, if you think about your vertebrae, you've got 31 levels to your spine. And each level has a joint, a joint on the left and a joint on the right. Those joints keep the spine connected, give us a little bit of flexibility, but ultimately the spine can't fall off. We can't dislocate our spine. If you think about what this is, it's a ring of bone. And these rings, they just stack on top of each other. So these rings, would dislocate if they were smooth. They've got to have this funny shape with the joints on each side so they can catch each other, click into each other, and stay stable. Now, joints in the back, like joints in the knees or hands or ankles or shoulders or hips, can get arthritis. And so that's one of the most common causes of back pain, arthritis in these joints. Now, that happens often when a disc flattens and brings the two sides of the joint closer together. And instead of a big, wide open space, where there's lots of room between the bones. As a disc flattens, all of a sudden the bones are really, really close together. And then that, those two sides start to hit each other, click, 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 click. And over time, those bones grow. Similarly to our hands, you know, if we work outside or we're working in the garden, we get callus on our fingers. And so if we walk inside barefoot, our cells and our skin divide. Similarly to the bones, as the bones rub together, they get bigger. And as they get bigger, they become rough irregular and they start to cause back pain. Very common uh, source of, of low back pain is, is joint arthritis and those joints are called facet joints. Now there's another big joint below the facet joints in the lumbar spine that goes into the sacrum. So in the sacrum as we transition a little bit lower this big joint right here is the joint between the low back, the spine, and the hip. This is called the SI joint. It is our biggest back joint and it's the strongest for weight bearing. Ultimately, it's responsible for splitting the weight of the upper body into the lower body. We've got one top half, we've got two legs. Something's got to split the weight and that's the SI joint. So it's got to be made firm, strong, and it's a little bit zigzagged inside. So it catches that weight as it comes down. And that joint is responsible for, uh, for keeping us stable. But because gravity only goes down, it's the one that takes all the force, or at least most of it. So it's responsible for so many people's low back pain. And when that joint gets arthritic, sometimes it's going to radiate its pain, not just in the low back, but it's going to radiate down through the sciatic nerve that comes out right beside it. And as the sciatic nerve comes out here, you know, it will, the inflamed joint or the irritated joint will often send its signal along the sciatic nerve, seemingly down the leg. Even though there's no real problem in the leg, sometimes it's just the SI joint. How come people have their sciatica hurt in different parts of their life? Well, that's a great question. 
and, a, and actually a very applicable question. So if you think about the sciatic nerve uh, causing pain from five different routes, you have L4 coming out of here, L5, S1, S2, and S3. The five of them come together through uh, the sciatic notch and, co and combine into the sciatic nerve. So if L4 is bothered, you're going to feel it in a different place than S1. They're both part of the sciatic, and they both go down the leg, but they go through different parts. L4 is going to involve a little bit more of the front side muscles, front side skin going towards the toes, while S1 is going to go more through the calf. L5 is going to be in between, and S3 is going to be in a different location altogether. So different people are going to be affected by sciatic in different ways based on which part of their sciatic is affected. And for some people, it's not any one of the roots. It's really the muscle that comes across. There's a muscle called the piriformis that attaches to the sacrum here, comes across to the back of the hip, and crosses that sciatic nerve. Sometimes it'll get too tight. Sometimes the anatomy changes a little bit, the muscle stiffens up, and just shoves the sciatic nerve inwards, putting pressure on it or even pushing it into the bone right beside it, causing you to have leg pain. Now, those leg pains can be variable depending on which part of the sciatic nerve is being pushed and which part is becoming symptomatic. When a nerve is pinched, what can be done? So, if a nerve is pinched, oftentimes it is pinched because a disc herniates just like this, and it's causing pressure onto that nerve that's passing by. Now, if that disc herniation is external like this, coming out of the spine, we can put a steroid, a cortical steroid, right on top of that bulging disc, that, that protrusion here, to see if we can deflate it. So to see if we can reduce the inflammation, shrink the swelling, it's actually like a fire extinguisher. And that can cause that bulge from being a really big bulge to become a smaller bulge. It might not go away fully, but it might be small enough that it's not bothering the nerve that's leaving at that space. Now, sometimes even with a smaller bulge, that nerve has been injured. You know, it's been shoved into the bone real hard beforehand, and it stays a little bit symptomatic. Maybe they feel better after the disc has been deflated, but it's not enough. Maybe they feel 40% better. Maybe it's not perfect. And so what we do sometimes is we do, do something called neuromodulation which is changing how the nervous system sends a signal. So a needle can be guided by x-ray to the edge here, to where the nerve is, to this little bulb called the dorsal root ganglion. That's like a little train station. It processes information, different lines going at different speeds. And we can change the signal that's going through there using something called pulsed radio frequency. That's a technology that has been around since 1973 in clinical use for chronic pain. Now, there are other causes for disc being pinched. Sometimes it's not just the herniation pushing the disc. Sometimes joints grow because the discs flatten. And as the disc flattens, instead of having a big space like this, cushioning bone A from bone B, separating them, it gets smaller. And these bones start to hit each other. And as the bones hit each other, their cells divide. Bone is alive. It's part of us. So those cells divide, creating something called bone callus, which is just very similar to skin callus. When we use our hands and do th uh, things that are somewhat abrasive or rough to our skin. And that dividing bone takes up space. So sometimes the bone, the bone growth, will push on the nerve, pinch it, and send a signal of pain. That will, in some cases, cause a nerve to swell, to be much larger than it should be. And that swollen nerve can again be deflated by an anti-inflammatory powder that can be put in to sit right there with the guidance of x-ray to shrink that nerve. If that is shrunk enough, and now that space, which isn't changing because the bone is not going to change its shape, it's not going to get bigger, smaller, or different shape by putting in a medication, that soft nerve sometimes gets shrunk in that small space and relatively increases the space around it so that it has more room, and it can function normally. Now, if that's enough, that's great, but there are other things to do as well. In some cases, again, we're using the pulsed radio frequency to change the signal throughput through the nerve, to change the volume, dial it down, or to normalize it. Some people are feeling more intensity, they're feeling pain, discomfort, and that sort of stuff, where we're trying to lower the intensity for them. Other people are feeling numbness, tingling. They can't feel their foot. 
So we're trying to increase their sensation to normalize. Both of those are components of neuromodulation that can be modified using pulsed radio frequency with an X-ray guided procedure. Now, there are cases where bone growth has gotten so big that it is dangerous to somebody. They're actually going to lose function or they're already losing function by the time they show up to our office. And in those cases, sometimes surgery is the right answer. So we do talk about that in some cases, although surgery has many pros and cons that should be discussed with a surgeon as well. What kind of testing is important? You know, this is a really common question. And the world has changed in the last 20 years with regards to information technology and the availability of reports and scans and images uh, coming straight to the patient. So the world has really expanded in a way that wasn't there decades past. In the past, scans were always sent back directly to physicians to be interpreted. They used medical jargon so that we could get a sense from the radiologist what a picture looked like without looking at the picture. Not all of those terms are important and different scans look for different things. So if we're thinking about getting an idea of what somebody's back looks like, we'll get an x-ray. X-rays are available very broadly and easily accessible. Now, x-rays will show us details for the bones. They will show us arthritis. They will show us the alignment of bones. And sometimes that alignment is, is important because the bones sometimes slide on top of each other. Our vertebrae are essentially rings of bone stacked on other rings, one on top of the other, creating a cylinder. Well, in some cases, that cylinder looks more like the Olympic sign, where somebody's bone has slid over. Sometimes that's because the ligaments are loose and there's instability, and so we can get special x-rays where there's movement. During the x-ray, we can watch bones move along each other, and that will give us information that's very different than an MRI. An MRI will show us the soft tissues. We'll see nerves, we'll see the shape of discs, We'll see if a disc has lost its contents, if something is spewed from the inside and entered the canal, or if a disc has been pushed outwards and not touching any nerves at all. In an x-ray, we can't really see those discs in detail. And in fact, the, neither test alone gives us everything. In some cases, to add to everything, we'll get a CAT scan. When we're thinking about a risk of things like compression fractures or problems with bone, CAT scans and x-rays see better detail than MRI. So if we're looking for information about a nerve, we're going to get an MRI. If we're looking for information about bones, like being worried about tumors or compression fractures, trauma, alignment, the shape of a fracture to see what kind of procedure can be done for that bone, we're going to get a CAT scan. You want a quick test, something that's going to show us a basic anatomy or show us an alignment, we're going to get an x-ray. If we want the details of the neuroanatomy, that's where we get the MRI. What are some emergency signs? So there are a few layers to, to this answer. Uh, there's something called cauda equina syndrome. And the spine, the cauda equina is part of the spine. As the spine dangles down, in the center of the rings of our vertebrae, our all of our vertebrae, again, are, are rings of bone. As the spine dangles down, it actually comes to an end at the bottom of the thoracic, the top of the lumbar. And from there, the nerves dangle on their own after the spinal column and the cord has come to an end. They just hang. They look like a horse's tail, and that's what cauda equina means. That's what it was named after. And that horse's tail, those nerves laying down, come through the lumbar, the sacrum, going into the legs, controlling some of our bladder and bowel function. So when those nerves aren't just irritated, aren't just, you know, nudged, aren't just causing some sort of discomfort, but really getting crushed and having a loss of function, people should know what those signs are. And there's signs in the areas that would normally be affected. So there's things like weakness in the leg, sudden changes, pelvic sensations that are just odd, strange, numbness, tingling, feeling like there's a grapefruit in the rectum, the bladder, the vagina, an inability to control your bladder or bowels. Changes in those habits that are sudden, those should all be treated as serious. 
an inability to feel the pelvic floor, going to the bathroom, wiping with toilet paper, and not being able to feel the toilet paper. That's not normal. If it's not normal, if it's suddenly changed, those are signs of an emergency. And, the, and people who experience these things should go to an emergency room, preferably one with a spine surgical team available. How do you know if you need surgery? Well, that's also a, a kind of a complex question. And the best person to ask is a spine surgeon. But let's go over some basics. Ultimately, when it comes down to the decision-making tree, that algorithm the surgeon is going to follow, they typically look for signs of weakness and nerve damage. So discomfort doesn't always result in nerve damage. And that's what our field is all about, allowing people to feel better, have a quality of life, have treatment options, treat the cause of their discomfort, their pain, their debility, if they are not at a stage where they're not going to have surgery. And the surgeons are hesitant to do surgery, oftentimes because of the potential complications. So when there is a significant anatomic problem, a big mass that they can cut out, they will. But when there's a small little hump that happens to be annoying to the nerve that's passing by, that annoyance matters. It really affects somebody's quality of life. But to the surgeon, they may be concerned that if they bring a scalpel there, a sharp object, the way that person heals, the way that person scars, they may have new problems developing later on. So they might be concerned that they would be doing more harm than good in that scenario, in which case those patients are probably coming to us for treatment. What else can mimic pain from the sciatic nerve? Ah, this one is an excellent question and a personal passion of mine. So, for the most part, there are four or five different things that can mimic sciatica. What first? Sciatica. <laughs> Sometimes it's sciatica. Often it's sciatica. It's one of the roots being pinched or two of the roots being pinched and irritated, causing pain through the sciatic nerve. The second is something called pseudo sciatica. Pseudo means fake. In medical terminology, it means fake. Something that mimics something else. Pseudo sciatica is a term for something called superior cluneal neuralgia. Cluneal neuralgia, well, neuralgia is pain from a nerve, but the cluneal nerve passes in a similar path to the sciatic nerve, and its pain is often interpreted as sciatica, even though it is not the sciatic nerve. It's a neighbor. So that's a nerve we can also target, and often do, to treat it. There is muscular spasm. Now, there are different muscles at different points along the chain that can tug the sciatic or tug on the cluneal to cause pain that radiates down. Muscular pain can itself radiate further down and mimic sciatica. And in those cases, those are treated very differently than treating the nerve. There's the sacroiliac joint or SI joint, which is the big, bo big bony joint at the base of the spine that splits the weight from our spine to our hips through our pelvis. It's the joint that catches our weight from the upper body and splits it into two legs. And it's responsible for doing that in, with stability. It's got this zigzag shape that is great for catching the upper body th with gravity. But gravity plays a uh, toll over time, and it causes that joint to have arthritis. Very common for a source of both low back pain and leg pain. And the last thing is a muscle called the piriformis. It's a thin, almost triangular, strip-like mus muscle that crosses the sciatic nerve. And as it crosses the sciatic nerve, as the sciatic nerve comes down, sometimes the piriformis will just push into it and cause it to feel discomfort by being too tight. Typical for piriformis is a long car ride or a long plane ride. You think about those nights when we sleep wrong, our neck's all twisted, and we get that knot in the shoulder area. Well, why? Because we folded a muscle during the night, and we kept it folded. It didn't move. It used up all its energy, all its oxygen. Those fibers crisscrossed and they stayed stuck. Well, that can actually happen just about anywhere in the body. So if we're sitting in the same car seat for 14 hours, going for a long car ride, well, same thing can happen in the muscles in our 
buttocks and where the sciatic nerve is. The fibers can crisscross as they get folded, as they get, have pressure on them, and that can keep them short. So then when we stand up, boom, the piriformis is now pushing it to the sciatic. Very common cause, easily enough treated with ultrasound guided injections. How can you treat SI joint pain, facet joint pain, cluneal neuralgia, or piriformis syndrome? So there are two ways that we can treat joint pain through intervention. One, we can put a needle into the joint itself, and we can inject something into the joint. That needle inside the joint can be used to deliver anything we need. It can use, be used to diagnose, it can be used to treat. We can use a, a needle to direct it beside the joint on top of the bone in a little groove where a little nerve branch comes in to feel the joint. And we can heat up that little nerve branch with radio frequency energy to cause that little branch to break down, to lose feeling to the arthritic joint. So people don't have to feel their arthritis. They don't have to feel the radiating pain of their arthritis. Because this pain can be just low back, and in some cases it can be low back radiating through the glutes or further down. After all, the big roots are right beside the joints. And when it comes to the SI joint, those big roots have passage immediately beside the joint. Their branches can be heated along the bone to disrupt the signal coming from the painful joint inwards so people don't know that they have arthritis. Fine, the branches grow back. It takes about six months in many people. If the metabolism is a little bit slower, people get nine months, a year, in some cases longer. But ultimately, there are two ways to treat. Inside the joint, or treat the feeling to the joint, the wiring, the nerve endings, the branches that connect to the joint. Because ultimately, we don't have to feel the pain through those branches. We don't have to feel the signal coming through from an arthritic joint. We don't have to know that we have arthritis. So the piriformis muscle attaches to the sacrum here and crosses over like this, going towards the hip bone. This crosses the sciatic nerve that comes out of here. And the piriformis muscle, if it shortens, if it flattens, it can be dilated. We can put, use an ultrasound machine to see the soft tissue layers, put a needle into the piriformis, and balloon it open with saline or any other liquid. Most of the time we use a combination of saline and local anesthesia. We don't have to use local anesthesia, but we like people. So why not freeze? We freeze, and that stretches. The saline stretches. All we're doing is a massage that's inverted. What do you get do when you, uh, when you have a knot in the shoulder area? You get a massage, you stretch it out, and from external pressure, pushing, 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 the fibers break apart. We're here, we put a needle within, and stretch from within. Balloon the fibers open. Balloon the fibers open. Release the pressure. Let the muscle stretch. As it gets longer, it stops pushing the sciatic nerve. Easy enough fix. Up here, along the iliac crest, there's a muscle called the quadratus lumborum that connects. Another muscle from above comes in, the latissimus dorsi, and connecting with the thoracolumbar fascia creates a small canal on the iliac crest, on the top of the pelvic bone. Through that canal, the clunial nerve passes, the superior branch, and that branch goes down over the glutes. So there are a number of treatments there. We can release the tension in the fascia and the muscle. We can go after the nerve itself, put an anti-inflammatory there, or we can heat up the nerve with radio frequency energy to break down the nerve so you don't have feeling through that painful area. What do I need to know about radio frequency ablation? Radio frequency ablation is a phenomenal technique. For one, it's been around since 1973. Unfortunately, in Ontario, it is very sparsely available. Very few physicians have the tools available to them, even if they have the knowledge to be able to treat patients with radiofrequency ablation. It's used in pain management, but in other fields as well. It's used in cardiology for arrhythmias. It's used in the cancer world to treat cancer. And it's used in dermatology as well. When it comes to pain, radiofrequency ablation is used to change or interrupt, stop the signal that's going through a nerve. And we do so so people don't feel their painful parts. So if you have arthritis, if you have painful muscles, if you have a nerve that's misfiring or it's being pinched or it's being damaged, those signals are uncomfortable and they can be changed. 
So radio frequency ablation is a mechanism for putting in a needle with a special tip and a wire on the back end that connects to the machine. And that tip of that needle gets hot or pulsates or sends a little energy waves to change the signal through the nerve. Or it gets so hot to break down a small branch of a nerve. Sometimes that's all we need. We have a small joint with a small branch plugging in. Well, if we heat up the branch before it plugs in, the branch melts down, disconnects, and we effect effectively unplug the joint. So we don't know we have arthritis. That screaming joint it doesn't have to scream at us anymore. Five months, six months, eight months, whatever the period of time it takes for a patient to grow that nerve branch back, they have a more or less normal life. The quality of life improves. They get to play with their grandkids. They get to grow their grocery store with normal function. They get to play tennis. But when the nerve branches grow back in, if nothing's changed about the anatomy, well, it tends to feel the same. If people do a whole lot of exercise in the meantime, things they couldn't do before, they get a whole lot of core strength, muscle strength, and change the support, the ratio of support between bone and muscle, so two sides of a joint aren't just sitting on each other, where muscle is holding up our weight. When that nerve branch grows back, it doesn't always presume pain. It doesn't just assume that this is a painful joint ahead of time. It will connect, it will ask, does this one hurt? Sometimes the answer is yes, but sometimes the person's being able to change their back enough that the answer is no. It doesn't hurt anymore. And they feel better for longer that way. If you have a question that you'd like us to answer in a future video, leave a comment below. And please remember to like and subscribe.